Welcome everybody to our November version of Hendry at Home, our virtual tasting series. We're excited that you're all here and I can tell that people are here because we're seeing the participant numbers um, tick up there. So welcome, we're excited everybody's here. Please put into the chat where you're tuning in from and um, who's, on, who's on the line. Normally we have Angela Douglas with us in the chat. Um, we, we let Angela have a very well-deserved day off today. So she's uh, enjoying time with her family. So Tamara is uh, stepping in and she's in the chat. So be sure to say hello to Tamara. Uh, and remember uh, to change your chat at the bottom of the chat box to all panelists and attendees rather than just all panelists. So that way Tamara can see all of your messages and everybody else can see your messages. Um, I thought we agreed to never let Angela take a day off. <laughs> I, well, I do sort of feel very lost at sea without her today. So setting this up, we thought like, we, yeah, we should keep her here all the time. She's <laughs> invaluable. So, um, but uh, welcome if you haven't joined us before. I'm Megan Carter. This is Mike Hendry. We're going to jump in here about a couple more quick housekeeping things. Um, we have a guest appearance today, uh, which is going to be exciting. And so um, shortly we'll have another panelist joining us. Oh, and there he is. There's Andrew Hendry. Hi, Andrew. Um, I'm going to um, uh, minimize Andrew's screen for the moment. Um, he's going to be joining us later. And so if you, you have an option at the top of your screen to change your view to gallery view or, or speaker view. And if you're in gallery view, you'll see both um, screens, our screen and Andrew when he's pulled up. Um, if you're in speaker view, whoever's talking will be featured. So you can set it according to whatever is most comfortable for you. Um, I think gallery view personally, I find a little bit easier, but um, you know, you can do what you like. Uh, when Andrew is, is speaking, we'll make sure his video is, um, is pulled up and, and you can see everything he's gonna share. Um, and because Angela is uh, out today, if you have any questions, the easiest way to get our attention is to drop them into the Q&A box. That's a little easier for us to follow along. Tamara's gonna be in the chat. Um, so if you get questions in there, we might not see them quite in time. So um, drop them in the Q&A and uh, we'll try our very best as always to leave room at the end to tackle those. So um, without further ado, let's, let's jump in here. Um, we, our topic today was kind of inspired by something we, questions that we hear from you all a lot actually over the course of all of these virtual tastings this year is, you know, we always feature two wines. Today we've got the 2016 Malbec and the 2016 Red Blend. And um, oftentimes, you know, people ask, well, what does it taste like? Can you talk about what it tastes like? Um, we always sort of joke that if we each described what it tasted like to us, that we'd be done in about five minutes, which is a very, uh, <laughs> a very entertaining virtual tasting. So um, true to our, our wine geek form here uh, at the Hendry Winery, we thought we'd really dive into the topic of sensory analysis. Um, so Mike will walk us through a little bit about our agenda today. Um, as you can see, we've got some fun props and uh, we hope you've got these wines open in front of you and can kind of taste along with us. Right. So we, we have tackled another gigantic topic that, that there's really no way to uh, get through all of. Um, and it's certainly not a topic that I know all about, but uh, all of us who, who take uh, study wine in school at one point or another eventually take a sensory analysis of wine class. Um, and at least for me, it was one of the, I think one of the best classes that I, I took at UC Davis. It was taught by uh, Ann Noble, who is the one who originally developed the, the wine aroma wheels that you've probably seen. Um, and there's a lot of very, very interesting science in those. But, you know, beyond that, you know, sensory analysis of, of anything is a big, a big topic. So this is a big book. A, a lot of it's statistics. Uh, some of it deals with wine. But people do sensory analysis for different reasons. And, and um, you know, some, some people who come to, to Napa are, are just wine drinking, some, some are wine tasting, maybe you're, you're that's fine. It's a time but, and a place for both. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but if your goal, for example, is to come and, and try to, you know, taste some wines that you might not be able to get at home and buy the ones you like and take them home, that, that's, that's one thing. Uh, growers, for example, um, we're always asking the question, if we do something in the vineyard differently, how will that impact the wine? Um, winemakers are asking questions about maceration times and fermentation temperatures and strains of yeast. And if you want to 
answer these questions, it, it always involves a sensory panel and, and some sensory analysis. Um, and there, it, it's, it's a big topic, it's a complicated topic, uh, and there, there are right and wrong ways to do it. Um, we're not gonna get overly technical with this, but we want to give you some ideas about how to maybe answer some of these questions yourself, some, some of the basic things you can do. Um, and we're gonna consider a, a scenario that, that my brother's gonna uh, help us with briefly. He's a, a professor at McGill University in Montreal. He, he talks a lot about statistics and teaches statistics. Um, so we're gonna give him a scenario and have him uh, show us maybe how you can get it right and how you can get it wrong. Um, so those are the basics. Uh, we're also gonna look at these two wines that we've sent you and, and apply some fairly informal sensory analysis techniques to them and then kind of describe what they taste like and, and how they <laughs> differ. Um, so the, uh, I, I think that really one of the most important basics of tasting is that if you want to be honest about differences or preferences, it has to be blind. Um, totally blind. Yeah. yeah. And, and this is a mistake that people make all the time. I, I think that, uh, um, you know, if, if you give clues about bottle shapes or, or even if you have labels in front of people um, and ask them to, to determine which wines they like best, you can, you can wind up with some, some very sort of predictable results if they can see the labels already. Um, very, very interestingly, I think some of the people who are really the best wine tasters um, are the ones with the least experience because they <laughs> tend to be, they don't come with preconceived ideas about whether they're going to like it or not. Um, and it's, it's honest, usually an, an honest evaluation of the wines. Um, people who, and it, this is true for all of us, if you, if you think you're really going to like something, you probably will. And if you think you're not going to like something, you, you probably won't. So you know, sometimes people with, with a lot of wine experience can be easily fooled by switching wines within a bottle that has a label that they know they like or, or vice versa. Um, and I think every, every professor that teaches sensory analysis has some example they like to use to, to, illustrate how important this is to students. Yeah, and the, the sensory class that I took, it was not with the great Ann Noble, but it was still a fantastic class. And um, there was one where, you know, we did a blind tasting and, you know, you put the, the bottle in the brown bag and so you can't see that. And to the extent that, you know, you can disguise the bottle shape, that was great. But what was left very obvious was the top part of the bottle where you could see the closure. So you could see if it was a cork or a screw cap. And I think he even, um, you know, tried to, you know, he said, I'm going to go set up the tasting and um, kind of left the door to his office open and it was clear that there was a, a box or a sort of the bag from a box of wine involved, um, you know, and he ultimately had done that on purpose. So all of us in the class, all these aspiring, you know, uh, winos, we were uh, we sort of keeping an eye on things and could tell, you know, we see, oh, well, that's a screw. Everybody's bag. looking for an edge. Everyone's looking for an edge. Yeah. And you think, okay, well, the cork one, we have all these perceptions about quality. And of course it was the same wine. Um, but you know, everybody went on and on about the quality distinctions between them all. So, you know, there are all, you know, even little things like that, like the, the top of the bottle and the closures can really, um, really influence your thinking. Yeah. So. Um, and, and one of the ways that we try to, um, make it harder or more honest, we have these, these black glasses. This is not, you know, something that most people are going to have at home, but you can, you can buy them and they are fun to, to test cool, people with. Yeah. It can even be harder than you'd think to, to tell the difference between things like white wines and rosé if you, if you can't see the color. Um, but even doing things at home, one, one of the downsides to, to doing sensory analysis of wines properly, or at, or at least more correctly, is that it takes more time. And, and if you're setting up things at home, you need to have somebody who sets them up and, and the order of the samples and how random that is is also important. But um, at a minimum, it, it needs to be blind. And, and this is something that is, is often... Yeah, and that's tricky to do if it's just two of you at home or something like that. You know, it's one person can maybe pour for the other. But, you know, in a lot of these trials, they do them, you know, where one person sets up the samples and then the next person distributes them. So they really don't know, you know, what's, um, what's in each glass. So blind is the most important part, um, understandably, for an at-home taster. Can be one of the hardest, but right. so critical. Yeah. 
And the reason that there are so many nice tasting rooms and nice tasting experiences is that wineries are trying very hard to make your tasting not be blind, right? <laughs> they're, they're trying to early on influence your, your, your yeah. perception and your mood when it, when it comes to yeah. tasting. Wine it. tastes better if there's a beautiful view and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and we, you know, we've all heard, we've probably all had this experience where we get you know, wooed by some amazing tasting experience and bring the wines home and then go, wait, this doesn't taste like I remember it, right? So we, you know, it, it's um, it's very difficult to separate your mind from your palate. Um, it, it's impossible, in fact. Um, but if you really want to evaluate differences in, in wines, that's important. So I think one, one of the, the most basic and most important types of tasting is what we call a difference test. Um, so something that happens here at the winery and, and with this red blend here um, is, is blending and, and people talk about blending and, and why you blend. Um, and it's happened more than once, it's embarrassing every time, but you can you can sit down and add small, you, you've got the wines in front of you and you add you know 2% of Petit Verdot, and then you see this incredible difference in, in the way the wine tastes, the mouth feel, it can really sort of light up the wine like a little saffron in the paella, you know, and, and then you, you, you go through all this and you say, wait a minute, I'm, I'm just gonna check myself blind on, on what I'm seeing. And what you find out, in fact, is that you can't tell a difference at all. Um, so then you're, you're back to square one and, and back to working on changes that are actually important. Um, but this is important in, in blending that there, there are, you know, you see this, I, I call them wine gadgets. There are all sorts of things that you can buy that are supposed to affect wine in one way or another. And, and you know, the, the, the clef du vin was this key to wine that you were supposed to dip in the wine and it would make, you know, eight, depending on how many seconds you put it in, it would age the wine some equivalent number of years. Um, there were these, I used to see them in um, the, the catalogs and airplanes, but this, magnetic device that you could put a bottle of wine in and it would sort of magically change the, the character of the wine. Um, th there are questions that we get that these, these are very valid questions to me. They're, they're questions about how you store wine and, and does that matter? Questions about how you decant wine and for how long you should decant wine. Um, and these are all things that can be answered at least partly with a difference test. So you, you wanna make sure first that you're making it, whatever you're doing is making a difference, and then you can come back and talk about what that difference is. Um, we, yeah, we do that here, you know, if we're um, <coughs> opening up a bottle of wine, and sometimes, you know, it, sometimes you get a bottle that's obviously super corked, and then sometimes it's a really, really kind of faint um, impact. And so you're like, Oh, this just me. Is this what I have for breakfast or something? You know, my, my nose off. And the thing we always do is we open another bottle of that same wine because that's, we, you know, if, if it is very different, then we know that, you know, it's cork or, or whatever the issue is. So, right. um, it's a, it's a simple thing to do and it is really instructive. Yeah. But I mean, if, if you want to, um, one of the standard ways of doing this difference test is with three glasses uh, and you make one of the three wines different and the question and, and you you present this blind to somebody or if, if you're you know honest and crafty you can scramble them around <laughs> so you don't know what you can blind yourself um, but the question is spot the wine that's different um, so you, you you go back and forth and you decide that this is the wine that's different and you know you you check the so, so one of these for example we, we put a mark on the bottom that's the different wine. Yeah. The first, and I'm sure a lot of you right now are saying this, but the, the problem with this approach first is that you've got a one in three chance of getting it right by accident. Um, so in order to, to make this something you're confident in, you need to get it right a number of times in a row. So if you get it right the first time, that was a one in three chance of, of it being an accident. If you get it right the second time, it's a one in nine. And if you get it right the third time, it's a one in 27. And if you can get it right three times in a row, you're starting to get to the level of confidence in that result that, that people make different. decisions on. Yeah. Um, there are other ways of doing it. You can, you can do two out of five, um, and, and if, which involves more glasses, but it's, it, it's a higher power test. You've only got a one in 10 chance of getting that right 
one time and, and a one in a hundred chance of getting it right twice in a row. Um, but it, it's a very, it's very simple. The, the, the statistics are very easy. Um, and it's a very powerful test that can answer a lot of the questions that, that people ask. I mean, if, if you, if you're worried about, you know, another question, if I, you know, drink a half a bottle of wine and I, I put it on the counter overnight or for two days, how is that going to affect the wine? And, and the first question you want to ask is, does it affect the wine, right? And, and to do this, you need to either have two bottles or you, you have a bottle that you don't have any airspace in, but you, you know, the next day you sit down blind and you ask yourself, is it different? Um, and if the answer is no, then maybe the next question is, what, what difference does two days make? And you're going to find a point where you know every time it makes a difference. And, and that's probably the time that, that you want to start worrying about. And that's something that depends on different wines and, and your palate. Um, so that, that's, you know, difference tests are a, are a, big, uh, a, a big tool and a powerful tool to, to answer these questions. Um, what gets more complicated is, is the descriptive analysis part of things. And descriptive analysis is made more complicated by the fact that we, that we all taste differently. Um, and there are different parts of when, when you, you describe what a wine tastes like, you're, you're, you're interested in what it smells like. Um, you're interested in, in the real definition of how it tastes, which is, you know, sweet and sour and, and bitter are the, the things that you taste on your tongue. You, you also taste salty and umami there, but um, if you find a lot of that in your wine, something else has probably gone wrong. Um, <laughs> and th those things, sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say, yeah, those are the things we taste as opposed to the aromas we're smelling, right? Right. Um, and those things can interact with each other in, in different and interesting ways. Obviously, we know that, that sugar can affect our perception of sourness, and sourness can affect our perception of bitterness. Um, but some of the problems with uh, how we taste, I, you know, humans in general, we have something like 400 different smell receptors, but in common, we share less than half of those. So there are smells that to some people are pleasant, to other people they're unpleasant, and somebody else might not be able to smell it at all. So this uh, creates a difficulty in finding a, a common ground. The same is true with the taste of bitterness. There are things that, um, there are certain compounds that to some people are horribly bitter and other people can't taste them at all. Right. And if you've been here to the winery in the last couple of years and done a tasting with George, he may have um, trotted this out, the PTC paper. Can you pronounce what the PTC is? I, Probably not. I, I think I knew it at one point. It's an but abbreviation, but it's essentially just a compound. Definitely not. Yeah, <laughs> on this strip of paper, um, this tiny little strip, and you put it on your tongue and some people, I mean, it looks just like a little strip of paper, put it on your tongue and some people find it horribly It's bitter. not a nice thing to do to people actually. And well, yes, because if you're in the group like Mike, where it is horribly bitter, then it, it, it tastes awful. I'm sort of in the medium camp. I taste bitter, but I don't have to spit it out immediately. And then there are some people who um, just taste like a piece of paper. Like, why, why did you have me put this piece of paper in my mouth? So um, it is really interesting, all the genetic differences. And so you're, you know, we've talked about making this blind in order to really um, these, you know, analyses to, to really make them sort of rigorous. But the other thing you have to do is kind of standardize it. And that's tough when all of the people participating in it are so different. Yeah. So I think we should, we should maybe stop for a minute. And we said this in our other tastings, but we hope that you no. are yeah. enjoying these wines while we talk. We're, we're going to continue to talk about the differences between them. Um, and maybe as, as you're listening to us ramble on and on, you can start to form some ideas about how they're different as well. Um, other important aspects of how you taste a wine, there are a number of things that really you're smelling them, but you can only smell them when, when you're tasting the wine. And, and we've smoke, smoke damage in wine is a big topic right now. And it turns out that there are things that you can't smell. You may smell a wine and it smells completely free of any smoke damage. But when you put it in your mouth, there are actually enzymes in your mouth that can release aromatics that you then taste later. So there are smell cut there. It's, it's, it's aromas by mouth really, um, but you can only 
taste them that way or smell them that way. You can't smell them on their own. Um, and then we have this, this broader category of mouthfeel, which may, everybody talks about mouthfeel. It, it includes things like astringency, like viscosity, like how the, how the wine physically feels in your mouth. Um, and we're going to, we're going to cover some of those things, but one of the biggest problems, and I've, I've had this, I'll listen to people talk about how a wine tastes or I'll read a review. Um, and there are times when I have absolutely no idea what that person <laughs> is talking about. Or if they say something like, you know, it smells like acacia flowers, maybe it does, but I don't have a good mental image of what an acacia flower smells like. If I, if it was March and I could run out and smell an acacia Find tree, an maybe acacia, I, yeah. I could. Um, so that complicates things. So when, when you're, you're sitting with a group of people uh, and you want to evaluate these wines and, and the group of people that we had to work with was the, the five of us uh, here in the winery, Megan and Angela and Tamara and Therese. Um, we have to, when, when we're talking about what something smells like, we have to all be on the same page. Uh, and when we looked at evaluating these two wines, we started with the tasting notes that Tamara made and she went through and listed a, a number of aromas where for, for the difference here, we, we, we looked at tannins and we looked at aromas and we left it to that. But um, she listed a number of, of aromas that she thought was important to these wines. So we tried to find standards for those aromas and then sat down and, and rated the intensity of, of these aromas in each of the wines. Um, so things that, that were important, uh, smoke was, was one of the things that came up and, and as an aroma standard for smoke, I, I found a smoked salt that was actually um, pretty pungent. Very smoky, yes. yeah. Um, tea was one and, and in here we have Earl Grey tea leaves. Um, there's a little cinnamon stick in there. Yep. Cedar was another um, aroma category. So I, after rummaging around for a while, I actually pulled a board out of one of my closets and shaved some <laughs> cedar shavings into some glasses. Does Molly know you did that? Um, she does now, yeah. <laughs> see, um, I don't know if you can see in all these glasses, we have little bits of these. So there, there are the cedar shavings. There we've got the, the cinnamon stick in here. It's a little hard to see, I think, but. yeah. Dry, dried cherries was another yeah. one of the, the aroma aromas that, that came up. Yeah. Dark fruit, we, we, when people talk about wine, I, I hear this all the time too, and, and you know, dark fruit or, or bright fruit, um, what do you mean precisely? And, and you know, you think with dark fruit, you're talking about things like, like maybe blackberry jam, maybe blueberries. Um, in consultation with Tamara, we, we settled on, you know, for the purposes of talking about dark fruit, in this tasting, we chose dried blueberries, which um, we, we, it was an, a reasonable approximation for what she had in mind. Um, and then the, the last uh, aroma standard we used was dried basil, which was another one of the things that came up. So what we did, we, we all sat down and, and looked at these and and had a set. We had a set. Yes. Each Every, of us had one of these. Everybody had their own set. And the idea was within these wines, how would you rate, rate the intensity of the aroma of smoke or tea leaves from zero being can't smell it at all to five being the strongest version you can imagine like what's in this class. And the idea is, you know, we talk about these things and as, as you taste the wine and another, I, I, I mentioned blind is very important, but another a very important aspect of doing this kind of tasting is not talking about what you're tasting. I, I think we've <laughs> probably all been in tastings before where there's one person who talks a lot and immediately influences what everybody thinks about what they're doing. So, you know, if you want to look at this, people need to sort of sit down independently, go through this process, and then you, you look at the results after. Um, and it was very interesting. We, uh, we, what I did was at the end of it, I, um, averaged everybody's score for aroma intensity for each of these wines. And then we plotted, I, I call them spider plots. They're, uh, they look like this. Um, and as you can see, you know, sort of a, a takeaway from this, uh, things like cinnamon and tea leaves, the intensity of the aromas were, we, we thought they were much higher in, in the red. Uh, things like smoke and, and dark fruit were uh, much higher in, in the Malbec. Um, 
And this is actually very consistent with what, what Tamara put in her tasting notes. So we, all of us sitting down together, really um, agreed with her assessment of these wines. Uh, there are others that, that um, you know, to, to me, I, I felt like the aromas of the, the dried cherry kind of aromas within the, the red blend was uh, considerably higher. And um, that was certainly not as universal. Um, things like cedar were sort of equal in the two wines. And interestingly, Tamara mentioned them in both wines. So um, it's a fun process. And you, you can do this with a, a lot of different wines. It takes some time to sit down and, and amongst yourselves with, with a cut with two or more, two or three. You, you want to limit the number. Um, but you first identify aromas in those wines that you think are important to the wines. Um, and then you talk about the intensity of those aromas and in a blind format, you, you look at it again and, and see what you come up with. Yeah, and I think too, it's also, I mean, we sort of touched on this a little bit, but you know, all this stuff also just takes practice. You know, as before we, we started before broadcasting, you know, we were saying, I, I said to Mike, I would love to do more of this stuff here at the winery. And um, because, you know, again, I don't smell acacia flowers all, all that frequently, you know, if that's going to come up, it's not one I see a lot, but um, you know, you just, you have to kind of get used to, um, you, you know, understanding what all of these aromas are. And, and the same professor that I took a, the sensory analysis class for pointed out that we've gotten really good at sort of um, tuning out, or maybe that's not the right uh, word, but sort of ignoring a lot of aromas in our day-to-day -day life because everything has an aroma. And if we let everything get in, you know, sort of, if we absorbed all of it, there, we would just have sort of sensory overload. Yeah. So, you know, there are a lot of things where I think, huh, I don't actually, I don't actually know what that smells like. I don't know how a nectarine smells different than a peach or, you know, because we don't practice it. So I think that's another thing that aside from um, helping a group say, come to some kind of consensus from just a personal tasting experience, I think this kind of thing, um, you know, it can be fun and also just really instructive yeah. and helpful. Yeah. So. And I think that we, so in the wine business and, and, you know, we know wine and food go hand in hand. So when you, when you talk to people who enjoy wine and you enjoy food, I think you probably have a, a, a higher level of interest in the way things smell and taste than, than most sure, people. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you have to pay attention to your nose and yet you have to, to think about it. And this, this, to me, this idea of finding a common vocabulary that you can communicate to people with is extremely important. And we, we talk about this, people use words like dry, and they can be, when one person uses dry, they can be talking about a completely different thing than another person means yeah. uh, when they use dry. So, you know, you've got, um, when a winemaker says dry, what she or he generally means is that there isn't really any residual sugar. Um, a lot of people use dry, and, and I, honestly, I feel like it's a better use of the adjective, but yeah. <laughs> to, to, to talk yeah. about the effect of the tannins on their mouth um, when they're tasting Right. So you, you have these, you, you have to, you know, if you're going to talk about how dry a wine is, you need to sit down with the people you're talking to and make sure that my dry is the same right. as your dry. If you ask everybody to evaluate the dryness of a wine, if one person is saying, do I detect any residual sugar? And another person is evaluating how tannic it is. And I've had lots of people describe a really acidic wine as dry you know so if someone else is looking at it from an acid point of view you know you're all going to come back with totally different things so yeah, yeah the vocabulary is important and i think this is sort of like you know shared vocabulary for your nose yeah i don't know what you'd call that <laughs> and, I, and again you know from the point where we started if you're not doing it blind you're really sort of right. wasting your time yeah. um but I want to I want to bring and this is where uh, my brother's gonna help yeah. us out but uh, you, you've I'm undoubtedly seen his um comments on the chat before he's he's chatty yeah um but He's a frequent listener first time caller so we're gonna pipe yeah, in here <laughs> so we we all of us at, at one point or another have probably been to a party at somebody's house where you know what you do is bring a, a bottle of wine in a brown paper bag and you know maybe maybe the idea is that the one who brings the wine that wins the tasting gets a henry magnum at the end of the tasting but Maybe if there's no clear winner, then the person who hosted the party gets to keep the magnum. So you want to make sure you get these results right. Um, so 
Andrew's here to talk about how you might approach this and, and how you can fool yourself in some cases. Over to you, Andrew. Okay, that's me. Um, I don't have any more Henry wine. I'm waiting for my next shipment, guys. But I got some Mike and Molly to keep me happy. All right. <laughs> okay, so um, I do teach at McGill University. And so I have done a lot of uh, work looking at statistics, and I've taught statistics. And Mike posed me the question is, when you're having a wine tasting where you have a bunch of people over and everybody rake, ranks or rates the wines in some way, how do you decide which wine wins the competition? And so with that sort of scenario in mind, I generated a few examples and scenarios and can try to answer that question for you, or I guess more correctly, point you to a couple of pitfalls that can occur and suggest that if you really want to get into this, some relatively easy solutions for fixing that. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, Mike Molly, thumbs up if you can see it. Okay, cool. So here's the scenario, right? You're at a dinner party, you want to taste the wines, and you want to figure out wh who brought the best wine. So everybody is going to rank these wines or rate these wines on one scale or another, and then you're going to give a prize to the person with the highest ranking. So here's the scenario that I set up just for the sake of this. Now it's a little atypical. You've only got seven tasters. So these are your judges. And then you've only got three wines. Now the reason why I picked three wines is just to keep it uh, relatively straightforward. Because if you've got too many wines out there, it's hard to tell what's going on. Now everybody scores them between zero and 100, which theoretically is the scale on which all wines would be scored normally. But of course, you rarely see low rated wines or low scored wines. However, for the purpose of this illustration, I've sort of scaled all of them. So the average across everything would be about a score of 50. So you're going to see some wines of 30 and you're going to see some wines of 70. Of course, that's not typical, but that's just for the purpose of illustration. Okay, so you've got your three wines, you've got your seven people, everybody tastes them, everyone gives them a score between zero and 100. And uh, the average is 50 and you look at the scores and here they are. So wine one gets an average score of 58, wine two, 53 and wine th uh, three, 44. So the person who brought wine three is really embarrassed and the person who brought wine one is super excited because now they have a, uh, a magnum of Henry to take home. So the big reveal here is that I generated these numbers at random. So these are just random reshuffling of all of the scores of all of the wines and all the people. So in reality, this is just random outcomes. It has nothing to do with actual preferences for the wine. And yet it looks like there is a preference from the wine. So just to give you a couple more of examples, I randomized a few more examples that you see here. And so sometimes you get you know, scores as high as 62 and as low as 45. Uh, sometimes there's less variation, but in all of these cases, the differences between these wines are just random chance, random shuffling, have nothing to do with any clear preferences for any of these wines. So if you really want to do this in a sophisticated way and say, does someone really come out ahead? You need to account for this randomness in asking whether or not there is a true difference and a clear preference between the wines, if you really want to get into it. So basically what you need to do is you need to account for these effects of noise or random chance by estimating a margin of error, like you might see in a, a political poll or something, which in statistics is called a confidence interval. Now I'm not gonna go into the details of how you do this, but it's actually pretty simple. And I found a really uh, nice tutorial on YouTube, uh, which is really straightforward, really simple, just shows you how to use an Excel spreadsheet to calculate these confidence intervals. Now what they are is you're basically placing a bound, an upper and a lower bound on what really the true value for your score for a given wine is. And what we're calculating here is a, a range from the high to the low in which you're 95% sure that the true preference for that wine lies. So let's go back to those random data now. So this is another random generation, but now let's calculate these confidence intervals for each of the wines around that average value. And this is what you see. So this is the highest 
uh, value in the lowest within that 95% range. So you'd only be outside of that range in your average estimate by chance 5% of the time. The key point is they all overlap. All of these confidence intervals overlap despite the fact that the averages look different. So the confidence intervals overlap dramatically. There's no clear choice here. So the host gets to keep the wine. And since you guys are the hosts and setting this up, this is highly to your advantage to use this confidence interval approach because a lot of the time you get to take the wine home. Now, just a couple of other ones. Here's some other random draws like I did before where the means look different, but in each case, the confidence intervals that reflect the range of possibility for the true estimate of the average score all overlap. So there's no clear choice. Now, the final thing I just did was say, what if there is a clear choice? What if you know people really scored one of the wines roughly a 30, one of the wines roughly a 50, and one of the wines roughly a 70? Now, I realize that that's not uh, a realistic scenario, but it's for the purpose of illustration. Then let's calculate the confidence intervals around those averages and you see something like this. So now the data aren't randomized. Now there really is a clear preference. And the question is, will this statistical method of confidence intervals uh, or margins of error reflect that? And so here you see that the averages aren't identical to the, the, the true preferences of 30, 50, and 70 because there's a bit of randomness involved but the confidence intervals clearly don't overlap. And so wine number one does quite poorly, obviously. It's a clear preference for wine three. And you do a couple of other draws um, from this expectation, and you see that you can always tell a clear difference between the wines. So there's clear choices among the wines. Wine number three, uh, the owner takes home the, or the person who brought that wine takes home the prize, and the, and the host does not, unfortunately. So just to, to close, um, these are the things that influence the extent to which you can get a clear difference between these values. If the wines are really different, then obviously you're more likely to pick up a clear difference between them. If you've got, you know, two buck Chuck and Henry in there, it's much more likely than if you've got Henry and Henry. <laughs> um, also, if you have uh, more variance among the judges, then you're going to get uh, a harder time to be able to tell which ones are different from each other. Also, if you have fewer judges, it's gonna be harder to tell the difference between them. So I posed seven individuals that are judging. If you have 20 or 40, then you're gonna have much more power to be able to see if there's a clear preference for one wine or another. And the more wines you add into the mix, the harder it is to tell that any one stands out above the others. So anyway, that's a, a really short crash course. And just a reminder that you can actually just go to that um, YouTube tutorial and you can generate a little Excel spreadsheet that will generate an estimate of how confident uh, you are in the score, average scores for a given wine. And then you can compare those confidence intervals, decide, is there really a clear preference for that wine? Or do we just open up the Magnum and share it among all the wines because there's no clear preference? Anyway, that's it, guys. Cool. All right. Thank you so much. No problem. Now All I'm going right. to go back to drinking. <laughs> exactly. And chatting. So it, it's, it's a nice reminder, I suppose, that if in life you want to ask and answer questions, that math is going to be involved at some point. So <laughs> I'm really hoping that we're going to start hearing stories from all of you. Like, you know, the next time there's a disagreement at your neighborhood, brown bag, blind tasting, you know, you can say, well, the, we can there wasn't enough the overlap, yeah. yeah, you know, and uh, so you can set the record straight. And um, maybe but it, but it is, yeah, and, and <laughs> you know, beyond that, with with this kind of sensory analysis, I mean, obviously, if there's a magnum on the line, then it's serious already. But if you're, you know, doing a trial, a, a, a trial of wines that you use different treatments in the vineyard, and one of those vineyard treatments costs a lot more money to do, you want to make really sure that it is actually better um so you you i mean this kind of um real sensory analysis is is um it's, involves a lot of statistics yeah and i would say too you know it's one thing when it's you know you and your neighbors or your family over the holidays and you know everyone's like maybe a couple glasses in or something but they do this and with all kinds of food and wine food and beverage right you yeah. know and and with wine 
we expect variation year to year and brand to brand and all of that. But you know, a brand like Budweiser has a panel of people who have been trained and, and you know, eliminating some of that randomness. And uh, you know, that Andrew was talking about with, you know, different judges whose, you know, preferences and palettes are gonna be different. They, you know, are trying to come in and make sure that every, every Bud Light that goes out tastes exactly the same every bag of Cheetos. Cheetos. I mean, <laughs> Frito, there's a lot more sensory science that's gone into this bag of Cheetos, I'm sure, than any wine you've ever had. They get right down to the color and the-, the Everything, um, yeah. So, you know, companies like Frito-Lay do a ton, they have spend a ton of money on panels and tasters and- And, uh, uh, and statisticians. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so we're gonna right. talk about one more thing. Um, if any of you are still with us, uh, it, that is the, uh, really, it's, we, I, I mentioned mouthfeel. Um, and one of the components of mouthfeel is astringency. Um, and astringency is literally the, the physical sensation that you get um, when the tannins uh, in the wine really bind to the proteins in your saliva and strip that stuff out of your mouth. And, and then you have this rough, raspy sensation. Um, you really, you're, lips have to be moving for you to feel this but you have this rough raspy sensation that comes from this physical drying out of your mouth and um you know even this is not a standard thing some people make more saliva than others and one way to look at the influence of, of this tannin is to actually time how long it takes for your mouth to return to normal um, so you can take a mouthful of wine you swirl it around you spit it out and and you think about what you're feeling and, and when your mouth starts to feel normal again, uh, you record that time. Now, it's important in doing this kind of analysis that you always let your mouth recover because there's this cumulative effect. If you take another sip before your mouth is fully recovered, you'll get a higher sensation of tannin. And even if that declines, you take another sip before it recovers. So you, you get this um, cumulative effect of, of tannins um, if you're, if you're not waiting long enough. So with these two wines, we, uh, and, and our five person tasting panel, um, we agreed pretty well that the, the tannin level in the red was higher. And, and for most of us, um, it took about 1.25 to 1.5 times longer for the effect of this tannin to, to uh, decline. Yeah, and um, I, I'd be sort of interested to know what everyone else is. You know, if you have these wines at home to taste them, I just took a sip of the Malbec and I still have that, you know, I'm, I'm still sensing the tan in there. So it'd be interesting to sort of see, you know, I think we had a, a range from 25 to a minute or so, you know, I'd be curious to see what, what it is for yeah. all of you. And then this is the kind of thing, if we're really going to compare numbers, um, it, this, we, we found out that we weren't <laughs> sort of timing ourselves equally. Um, so there, this, this is the kind of thing that takes a little practice and training too, but um, it, it definitely showed. And, and so beyond that, you can look at these two wines and you can start to think about what blending can do for you in, in terms of wine making. I mean, really Malbec is, the, it's about a, a little more than a third, but it's the biggest ingredient in the red blend. But you can see how these other components have shifted it in different directions. They've, they've made it more tannic, more structured. Um, they've shifted it to a, a you know, I, I would say a more red fruit style of wine. And there are some herbaceous components that you don't see in the Malbec so much. Um, yeah, it's shifted the fruit from a, a dark fruit to a, to a more red fruit um, and added some herbaceous qualities and, and structure. And that's, that's part of the power of, of blending when it comes to winemaking. Right, yeah. Um, I mean, you had mentioned, so you talked about uh, pitfalls. And Andrew had mentioned this as well, you know, and um, the cumulative effect. I mean, I think that's the other thing. And as Mike said at the beginning of this, we can't go into um, you know, every single type of uh, uh, sensory analysis test there is. But I think some of the things to keep in mind, again, making sure it's blind is important. Um, you know, standardizing, um, you know, the, the panelists. Um, you know, randomization is important. And I think that's something that if you always, if you taste, if you do this test, you know, every single, you know, 10 times in a row and, um, you know, wine B always comes after wine A, you're never gonna, you know, wine A will always be influencing wine B. But what about if you have wine B after wine C, does it change your experience at all? So, you know, that you start to get into levels of permutation that can yeah. result in a lot of glasses, <laughs> a lot of, you know, orders, a lot of, a lot of work. But, 
Um, so that, I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely critical to, to randomize the orders of the samples actually. And, and that's another topic. So it is, it is very, you know, it, sensory analysis is a very rigorous science and, and a, a very important science to, to, you know, people in our businesses, but you can answer a lot of very, like if you just go back to the difference test question, you can answer a lot of very important things about wine very simply. Um, the, the sort of the deeper analysis of the real sensory analysis and significant differences among wines from a, from a aroma, flavor and, and mouthfeel point of view um, takes more time and setup and training, but um, it can, can be also very important right. and very worthwhile. And as Mike said too, it's like this is important for us as we're thinking about differences that we might make in the vineyard or the winery. Um, but as a, just a consumer, you know, some of that stuff might not be quite, you know, maybe, maybe to you it doesn't matter as much. And, you know, my instructor pointed out there is also what he called the hedonist test, which is just, do you like it? You know, yeah. and, and, and that's important too. One, one of the, actually at the end of the day, one of the best ways to see which wine wins the brown paper bag competition is the one that's empty first. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, also very um, scientific. But things like, I'm sure you've seen these before. Um, Anne Noble has, has a, a version of this on her website. And I, again, mentioned there's some the really very interesting one. science yeah. on this. This is the, the wine folly one, but it, it, it sort of tells you groups of related aromas and, and it can be helpful when you're tasting a wine to, to sort of scan through it. And, and um, it's, it's a good mental refresher of, of things to, to look for or think for. Right. Um, and there are, I mean, there, there are much more specific ones. This is a, um, you know, wine aroma wheel for white German wines and red German wines. So there are, um, you know, specific. things like Gewurztraminer. Yeah, they, they, they can have some very uh, floral and, and sort of specific characteristics that are, you know, not unique to that grape, but limited to, to a, a smaller range of grapes. Uh, and then beyond that, there, there are things to help you taste that are um, uh, d different organizations have different sort of formats for, for helping you approach a wine consistently in terms of how you evaluate it uh, and, and taste it. So, you know, the, the Court of Certified, Ma Court of Master Sommeliers has a version, the, the W set has a version, um, Wine Folly again has a version, and, and you can make your own. Yeah, and I, that was an assignment I had in, in my sensory analysis class, sort of taking all that and making it work for you, um, which I found to be really helpful. I mean, I think some kind of order and you know, standardized approach is really helpful. You know, if you think about two wines and say the acid levels in one are, um, you know, much higher than, than the other, you know, if you don't have some kind of standard way to sort of think about those, you know, that's all it's going to kind of stick in your mind and you might sort of forget to look at all of the other components. So um, I found that it was really helpful to make my own and, and, and focus on things where, you know, perhaps I would overlook them if I'm not reminded. So you can like play around with it too. So in December, we're going to talk about wine and food pairings. <laughs> so, we're, so we'll see which of these wines pairs better with Cheetos. When I was a kid, my dad would sometimes sneak us Cheetos from the vending machine at work when he picked us up from daycare. And we weren't smart enough to um, get rid of the evidence on our fingers before <laughs> going into the house. But um, This yeah. is maybe a little off, off topic, but I have one Cheeto anecdote. Um, I know a fishing guide who for snacks in the day keeps a, a big bag of Frito-Lay chips of all different kinds, including Cheetos. And one day when he forgot to remove it from his boat, the raccoons got in there and they ate everything except the Cheetos. They, they <laughs> would not touch the Cheetos. So clearly Frito-Lay does not have any raccoons on their sensory panels. Um, but yes, but yeah, I, so we will, we'll, we'll, I think some of this stuff transitions nicely into the December topic where we talk about pairing food and wine. Um, I know it, over the summer we had a, gr a great discussion about wine and Pop-Tarts. Um, so, you know, bring any, oh yeah, you don't remember that one? Um, yeah, so so bring um, the Olsen's, I believe, um, paired, paired their wines with Pop-Tarts. So uh, please, you know, come, come with ideas for that one and we, could, we can try all kinds of things. Um, so in the 10 minutes we have left, I'm going to go to the Q&A here, and again, please dump um, any questions in there, and this is 
testing my eyesight. So um, I, I can, so how would this analysis change if the ranking was based on a, a forced rank? So let's say your, oh. your favorite wine is wine number one. And then, and then instead of the highest score, you know, being the winner, it's the lowest score that's the winner. And, and the analysis should be exactly the same. There. Yeah. But that is, I think a good um, question, Eric. And I, you know, one thing, you know, the, the scale makes a huge difference. Um, you know, oftentimes people find that they sort of gravitate towards the middle of a scale. So thinking, you know, about that when setting up your scale is really important. Um, and, and defining the scale, because I think one question is, you know, are you evaluating the tannin level in a wine? And, and you know, are you talking about all wines or are you talking about Cabernets, right? You know, I mean, and, and so what's your sort of baseline? Is it is it varietal specific or is it all fine? Yeah. So the, yeah, those definitions are really, I think, important too. And a, a question from Julie Snyder. Hi, Julie. Um, and, and this is, uh, do I think water or just plain crackers does a good job of, of cleansing one's palate? I'll tell you one of the problems I have with crackers is that I feel like they're actually competing with the tannins to strip all the saliva out of your <laughs> mouth. So it, it's, um, you know, I think water is better, but I think time is the best. Just kind of wait a while and, and let your mouth recover. Um, so they, they, I mean, they, they both, I mean, I, crackers are helpful sometimes too, but they, they, they can really add to the sort of the dryness in your mouth. And if you're trying to recover from tannins, it, it can add to the problem. Yeah. And George always uses the example of a fat, you know, he's used olive oil and things like that. Um, Partly because, yeah, oftentimes people aren't waiting two minutes between every every sip. Yeah, <laughs> right. You know, time time is maybe the best, but who has time for that? Yeah. So um, also, uh, this sort of this question of of something fat or oily as a palate cleanser. I, I I don't. I wouldn't use that as palate cleanser, but but richer foods and by rich i mean more oily or, or fatter they they can definitely change how tannin interacts with your palate and and the time it takes for that to recover and i'm not precisely sure what the chemistry is there but if you and and you know many of you have done this here with george and, and olive oil but that olive oil really limits or or reduces the astringency of the tannin and so so people who are very tannin sensitive and, and tannins are often bitter and, and people who are very bitter sensitive um, really will enjoy some of these wines with a little more oil or fat than without. Yeah. And then James asked um, about the Malbec. Mal Malbec seems remarkably light and sophisticated when tasted against the red. The red is more complex um, to his palate. Any thoughts on why this might be for a single varietal versus the blend? Um, so, and, and I, I kind of agree with you. I, I feel like there's a, a bigger range within the blend, a, a bigger range aromatically. And, and I think one of the, I mean, there, there are hundreds and hundreds of aromatic compounds that are relevant to wines. And you would think that in general, combining a number of varieties is going to increase these, this, the range of aroma compounds. So, um, it's very, um, I, I think that adds to the complexity almost by definition. Um, but it, you know, to me the, the, the Malbec is more, it's very, it, it's very drinkable. It doesn't have as, as big a range. It's, it's lighter in tannins and it has a very, um, a very nice sort of dark fruit component, um, which, which is, uh, you know, maybe not something that you want to maybe complexity is good, but sometimes you want to focus on a component. And, and in that case, it's that, you know, that nice, ripe, dark fruit that, that makes the Malbec so pleasant. And Dennis here also asked a question about the Malbec. He said to him, it, it changed with time more than the red. And can we talk about the time in the glass as a variable? So this might be a, a good difference tasting yeah. example. Um, but I will tell you one thing that, I mean, Malbec is very, has incredibly high, level of total phenols and in fact it's actually much higher than the cabernet um, at, at least in in one analysis that we did several years ago um, it's not higher in tannins that the, the cabernet has much bigger tannins but in terms of total phenols uh, the, the malbec was a lot higher and phenols are things that react with oxygen so the 
Malbec in the cellar can become, so we, we have wines that are oxidized. You can also have wines that are reductive, reductive if they're limited in, in oxygen exposure. And the Malbec was a wine that, um, you know, when it was very young and in barrel, it could actually be much more expressive and aromatic after it. And it, it's one of the only wines I've ever said this about, but you could leave it in a glass for a day. And the next day it would be much more expressive and pleasant aromatically. Um, so the, 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 what, what's interesting and what's worth questioning here is the rate at which these reactions occur. And they don't, I mean, wine is reactive, but it's not immediately reactive. So you will see changes in time, but this is why I think with decanting off, often the meaningful changes occur after two or three hours and, and not necessarily a half an hour. But again, these are very good questions to, to answer with a difference. Yeah. Okay, tasting. So, you know, if you have two bottles of Malbec, open one, give it, give it a half an hour or an hour and open the other one and do it in the blind format and see if you can spot the, spot the different one. And you had just a definitional thing, you had mentioned reductive, um, sort of being the opposite of oxidized. Yeah. Right? So what does that mean in terms of winemaking? Yeah, it, it, uh, in terms of wine or, making, or in the, sorry, wine analysis. Here. It's yeah. sort of sensory characteristics. Sensory, yeah. So it, it, I, I find it, it sort of kills the fruit. It becomes, um, like I, I wanted to use the word medicinal. Like it, it's a, it can be a, you can have this sort of chemical and we, you know, we, we would want an aroma standard for this, but it's this sort of chemical, non-fruit phenolic, again, a, something that's, maybe not that meaningful unless we have an aroma standard, but it, it shifts the wine from, from expressive and fruity to more chemical and um, kills the fruit. That's, you know, maybe not the most best way to talk about it, but it's, it's, it can be unpleasant. And this is one of the, the, the problems with wine and kegs. In fact, and if you have a, a wine that needs, oxygen to be expressive aromatically when you clamp it up in a, a stainless container for long enough it starts to lose those aromatics yeah um all right so uh to round things off we i've noticed and again it's it's hard for us to keep up with the chat exactly i've seen some fun um discussion going on though and uh, this though to me really takes the cake and I think it's how we should end. So I remember as a kid, you know, uh, we'd have dinner and uh, if my parents, you know, opened a bottle of wine, I can remember they would have a competition amongst themselves to see if who could come up with the most sort of outrageous uh, descriptors for the, the label. Because I think we've all seen those bottles where the back label, I mean, promises everything. Um, so that was always kind of fun. And, and I know Tamara asked the group what everybody's most unusual um, descriptors were, and if you didn't see this, I think it's worth highlighting. Um, Julie Snyder says her favorite was, quote, the wine walked in and wiped its feet on my tongue. <laughs> 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 and you know, that's actually, I do get a sense of what that wine's gonna be like. So that's actually fairly descriptive and, and very fun. So um, anyway, we'll end with that. Uh, thank you guys all so much for joining us again. Um, we're glad to be back with everybody and we're really excited about um, taking this into December and talking then about holiday food and wine pairings and, um, you know, share it with your friends and family. You know, I know the holidays are going to look different for some people this year. So, um, you know, your family can still get together and, and have a tipsy holiday just with us too. So <laughs> um, we'd love to see you then. Uh, anyway, thanks again and we'll see you in a month. Thanks everybody. Bye.